Jim, Jim Marie, uh, welcome. Lovely to see you. It's good. It's good to see you again. Yes. Thank you yeah, for having us. It, it, uh, March 2021, we did an interview or a chat, really, about um, Dive Heart. Um, I can't believe where time's gone. I know, it goes quickly. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're here to talk about a new documentary mm-hmm. that is about Dive Heart, really. Um, but first of all, can you just remind us what Dive Heart is and what you do? So Dive Heart is a 501c3 charity out of the United States. Uh, We work with people with various disabilities, so cognitive and physical, and we use scuba diving as a therapy. So we call it scuba therapy. And we take trips. We are also a training agency within the scuba world, and we are specific uh, to training people in the adaptive scuba world. So we train buddies, instructors, as well as adaptive divers. We also do research with university medical centers around the country, uh, looking at the benefits of zero gravity and uh, adaptive scuba and and everything from range of motion to pain management and uh, the alleviation of PTSD symptoms. So it's very exciting. It's an all encompassing thing, isn't it? It's it's just turn as people, whatever their disabilities or even not dis- disabled, get underwater. It, it's a whole new world for them, really. Um, I, I I just love what you're doing. I think it's I think it's amazing. Just, just briefly, out of the years that you've been going now, um, have there been any surprises in how people have reacted? Um, being taken underwater? Well, I know that in the pool, so we start a lot of people in the pool, and there was a group of veterans, um, mainly from uh, the center that assists people who are blind or going blind or have some sort of visual um, impairment. And the people who were um, dealing with macular degeneration, which is where they slowly lose their eyesight, uh, it was almost to a person, every time we brought them underwater for the first time, they'd pop back up and be like, oh my gosh, I can see. <laughs> and it was the refraction in the water somehow that gave them back the eyesight that they remembered from before the disease or before they were, they were losing it. So I always had to remember the first couple of times it happened, I got scared because I'm like, you're not supposed to pop up out of the water like that. But when uh, I knew it was going to happen almost, I said, okay, we're, we always start people in the shallow end, but I'm like, I'm going to let them have their moment and then we'll get to the rest of the diving. So I think intuitively we always, I always believed when I started teaching in 97 individuals with disabilities that, that water would just be forgiving, you know, and mainly I was thinking about physically impaired individuals. Uh, had no idea we'd be working with individuals with autism and, and Down syndrome and cognitive impairments that also have benefited from this. Um, but one of the things that did surprise me was we did some research with the Illinois School of Psychology. And one of their researchers came to us after talking to all of the veterans we'd worked with around the country over the years and said, Jim, did you realize that the very first pool program is the most powerful and that's the one that really creates that paradigm shift in the way they look at themselves and think. And I'm like thinking, why is that? And when you think, you know, when I thought about it, I thought, well, you know, it's not natural to breathe underwater, right? So the first time we get a vet or anyone in the water and they go and they breathe, sometimes they pop up and they're like, oh, I can't do this. And you just laugh now and say, it's okay. It's not natural to breathe underwater. Your brain is going, what are you doing? Are you crazy? <laughs> right? So once they get past that, and then I think if they're physically impaired, especially when they can look down and see themselves standing for the first time since their injury, or maybe the first time in their life, if they're born with a disability and they're a wheelchair user, that is very powerful. So that first pool session, I could see why they found that, that result. And it's not just, yeah, it's the first one, but she said up to like the first 20 or, or 30 really still has that impact on them of of showing them things that they didn't think they could do, you know, just Mm -hmm. helping enforce that positive, um, the positive thought on their own abilities. 
you know, it affects them in that way. We had a, we had a really big surprise too, Jeff. Um, good. You know, they say good divers are always learning, right? Well, uh, at the end of 9, 2019, we had a trip uh, and we came up after the, the dive and we had four groups of individuals that were all wheelchair users and all of them had catheters that they used to go pee basically after they go diving, which they have to do. Otherwise they'll get a condition called autonomic dysreflexia, which is a noxious stimulus. And we feel when we have to go to the bathroom, they get this noxious stimulus. They feel this pressure, headaches, whatever. And then they have to cath. And when they cath, then that relieves all that. And, that, and then it goes away. But what happened is we, we came up from this trip and we, we looked up and this boat says, pulls up to us. It wasn't our dive operator. It's in Cozumel, Mexico. And so we have these four teams and, and the boat operator says, come on, get on. And we're like, well, you're not our, our dive operator. We're with Dive Paradise. And they said, your boat is broken down. It's on the other side of the island. So now I have four teams each quadriplegic and paraplegic has to cath or they'll get this condition, autonomic dysreflexia. So we're like coming around to the back of the boat. We have to board this boat. There are no wheelchairs. There are no pads that they need to protect themselves when they sit in their wheelchair. So now we're like grabbing life vests and putting them on, on seats. And I held in my arms a quadriplegic and we kept our wetsuits on. So we had cushion, but I held him in my arms while we're like desperately radioing our boat or somebody to get a fast boat down to get these wheelchairs down because all their medical supplies and their catheters were on this. And, and thank the goodness, um, even though people, emotions got very high at, at times when people thought that they were going to have this autonomic dysreflexia, they got it to us in time. We were able to have everyone calf. Then we transferred them safely back to, the, to our boat, to the other boat. But that was like, wow. I never, that's never happened. I mean, I've been doing this since 97, but what we did then during the summer is we developed a protocol. We took catheters and we put them in our buoyancy compensators and we put them in our wetsuits and we put them in little Pelican type cases. And we tested over the summer, went to hundred feet with these devices to see if in fact they would be compromised and, and they, they weren't. So it worked out really well. And so it taught us. And now when we go on trips, we carry extra catheters in the bat, in the, the BC pocket for the individual with the adaptive diver, the individual with the disability, but we also carry extras on ourselves. So if this ever, hopefully it'll never happen again, but if it does, we'll be prepared. And, and, and we share that with the industry. So anyone working with an individual with a disability will now know how to handle that situation if it occurs. So that, that was a surprise. <laughs> My goodness. That is um, really amazing. It, it's, gosh. Yeah. I don't know where to go from that. That was stunning. Let's go, <laughs> let's go straight to the film that's, that's um, just been been made and coming out and um red carpet event at um a theater Tivoli Tivoli is that how oh, the Tivoli. Tivoli. Tivoli sorry in Downers more... Grove. so we're having the we're having the premiere in our hometown which is really cool and uh, we get to share it with our the our closest 1,000 friends that are going to come out and, and see it, hopefully. Oh, um, where is that? Where is... Uh... It's, in, it's in Downers Grove. Where, uh, Downers Grove is about 30 miles out of the out of main Chicago. Straight west, yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Um, so being in the theatre, um, I'll, put a, I'll put a link up how people can find out better, get tickets and things. But tell us about the documentary. Um, David Marsh... Uh, right, so it, it's interesting. It's it's a documentary with Dive Heart in it, but it's not necessarily a di it's a Dive Heart story, is what I'd like to say. But um, the story really is it revolves around David. I'll let Jim tell the story of, of David. Uh, we met him last summer while we were in Cozumel and checking out the resort again, because we hadn't been there in two years. So we were planning a December trip already. We knew we were going, we knew we had people coming. So we went out in September just to say, let's take a look at this. You know, there were, people had changed, leadership had changed. So we wanted to make sure we knew what was going on before we brought 
40 people down there. Yeah. And we met David that way. And I'll let Jim take it from there. Yeah, he uh, he was on the same boat as, as we were. We were training their staff to do transfers on and off the boat, uh, in and out of wheelchairs, just so that even if we weren't there, they would know how to handle adaptive divers and individuals with disabilities. So we would train in the afternoon. And in the morning, we were, we were doing some pleasure diving. And David Marsh was on the boat with his family and came up to us. He was staying at the same hotel, Hotel Cozumel. And he, he said, I overheard you talking. I'm fascinated and learned what we did and said, I'm a filmmaker in Los Angeles. I want to do something, a documentary with you. So we said, okay, sure. And, you know, people say stuff to us all the time. And, and he called three or four times after we got back. And I, this guy's for real. And so we said, why don't you come in December? We have 40 divers, like Tina Marie said, eight with disabilities, five wheelchair users, nice diversity of uh, people with disabilities, everything from um, autism to Lou Gehrig's disease, spinal cord injuries, stroke, um, traumatic brain injury. We had really a plethora of individuals with a variety of disabilities. So he started doing backstories in September all the way up till Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving was a week prior to the trip. So he had learned about all these different disabilities and their backstories and creating this amazing dive, dive heart story about adaptive diving. And then what happened on Thanksgiving day, his son had just gotten out of rehab. He was suffering from, uh, he was an opioid addiction and got out of rehab, got a job. Everyone was excited. And David's family came to Thanksgiving dinner. After dinner, he um, overdosed and died at David's house. Um, David obviously was, you know, what do I do now? You know, I'm, I'm supposed to go on this trip with Dive Heart. My son has passed. And he had been struggling with this for a while. And, and they tried to fix it many times and, and was weren't able to fix it. It wasn't on them to do that. So he and his family decided that he would come on our trip. He came on the trip and didn't say anything about this. We had no idea. So he and his brother are roommates. And during the entire week, and these are the kind of guys that when they weren't filming, they were pushing individuals in wheelchairs back to their room. So they were just really salt of the earth kind of guys. Every morning, David was getting up after he would interview individuals with disabilities for that day. And maybe the theme of that day was trust. And he would, he would interview them and talk about how they had to trust us to transfer them safely on the boat and off the boat and be underwater and, and care for them basically. And then the next morning he would turn the camera on himself all by himself at the pool and say, trust, you know, I have to trust now in my life. And he would talk about what he was going through losing his son and, and what the future held for him. And, and one day was about adapting. And he said, I have to adapt now. And it was amazing. I mean, the testimonials he was getting from the individuals with disabilities were so resonating with what he was going through in his life with loss and, and different things and uh, coping and challenges. And so we did not find out that David had lost his son until the last night. And we have a go around at the very first day we, we have, we talked to 40 people. Hey, Jeff, how, you know, why are you here? Blah, blah, blah. Then the last night we go, Hey, Jeff, how was the trip? What'd you think? And everyone's laughing and crying and hugging. And we're all family by then. And David's the last one to speak. And David is, has a great sense of humor, tells a little bit of a joke about somebody. We all laugh. And then he says, no one knew this, but, and his, his brother, Scott, is filming him while he's talking about losing his son and how this trip was really transformational for him in coping with his loss. And, and dive masters, you know, grown men standing behind him that you could see tears are running down their face. And, and we're just like, oh, my God, everyone's jaw dropped. And that's how we found out that he lost his son. So this, this turned into what was going to be a, di a, a documentary about Dive Heart. Filmmaker friends of his in Los Angeles suggested after they saw the first 20 minutes, they go, David, this isn't about Dive Heart. This is about your journey with Dive Heart. So really you go through the, really almost the entire documentary 
not hearing anyone say die hard until the very, like the end. And then David says, this has been transformational. I love die hard. I mean, it's just like, wow, very powerful. It, it turns into, you know, the, the, the main part of the discussion throughout the film is nobody knows what anybody's going through. You look at someone and you might think you know what someone's going through because you see them in a wheelchair, but you don't know. You might think that you know um, what someone is capable of and they might have a speech impediment, but their brain is 100% and you don't give them that um, understanding because you assume, well, if they can't, you know, if they sound slurry, then maybe it's because their brain is slower, you know, is, is, is having a problem. And, um, and that might not be the case. And so the whole idea is we never, we don't know anybody's real backstory. And that's why you always have to be compassionate. You always have to um, be understanding. And at the same time, everyone is always adapting. They're, they're adapting because they're going through a struggle. They're adapting because they lost someone. They're adapting because they lost an arm or have an illness or getting, they're getting older, <laughs> right? The whole, the whole thing. And so I think he did such a wonderful job at showing how this particular group of people inspired him and, and helped him start his journey after this loss of healing and and giving himself the room of saying, I will forever be an adaptive person because I have to adapt to this loss in my life. Mm -hmm. and, and it'll always be a loss in my life, right? Losing mm -hmm. a child is, you know, very, very much something ripped out of your life that, that could be akin to losing an, an arm or the ability to walk or the ability to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I think he, he was very... Um, and it was amazing because these people that we work with are inspiring and they, they do show us that maybe my problem isn't as big as I am making it up in my head, <laughs> right? Um, because I do get to get up every day and take a shower that doesn't take me an hour and a half to complete. Yeah, we're excited about having David come in uh, and his brother, Scott, for the premiere to, oh, great. great. Yeah, to answer questions. And um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're doing it up. I mean, Tina Marie, you know, wanted to do red carpet and, and we were going to have a, a step and repeat with the Dive Heart logos behind. So it'll it'll be all that in a bag of chips. And uh, we're, we're really looking forward to, to sharing the story with not only our community, but we have individuals coming in from as far away as uh, Hawaii and all four corners of the, of the U.S. and maybe even Galapagos. We had individuals from Galapagos on the trip who may come in and bring a, a, a team that was with them to the premiere. So we're very excited about people coming from all over the world to Downers Grove. I, I, I just look so forward to seeing this. I mean, unfortunately, I, I can't get for you to see it for real. But, and, and I'm sure there's just a lot of people who'd love to see it and aren't going to be able to. So is there a point then where it's coming online or on TV or? After, after the premiere, um, we already have it up. David has it up to, um, for it to be able to be picked up by an Amazon or a Netflix or other mm -hmm. um, streaming services. So we figure that by the time we have the premiere, um, the movie or the film might have already even been picked up by that. He just, he had mm -hmm. another documentary he did mm -hmm. before this that is on Amazon, Amazon Prime. Prime. Yeah. So um, we're hoping that this will, and he's, and he told us, of course, he's telling us, but he's like, and this one's better than the one I did before. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, his objective, our objective is to um, get as many people in the world to be able to see it and be inspired. And, and hopefully go, we could do that here. We actually have a couple other showings that we're planning. Uh, David's in town till the 22nd of May. And on the 19th, we've already got confirmation that at Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, at the university, we'll be, we'll be doing a showing That's there, great. a screening there as well, showing screening. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll be doing that. Yeah. Well, uh, um, look, if, if, at the end of this, I'll... You sent me a link to um, a trailer? YouTube trailer. 
Yeah. Um, so I'd like to show that at the, at the end of this ch uh, our chat. Absolutely. Uh, and would you then keep in touch with me afterwards and just let us know when it comes available globally so that Absolutely, I, yes. I can reintroduce it? Yes, <laughs> yeah. right now we have, um, we have the information up on our website as well. So we will definitely be sharing it. Um, through all our social media, on our website, as soon as we have um, something where everyone can go and see it. And I think, I think the Q&A when David gets on the stage after people get a chance to see his work, I think will be powerful. So we have friends that do video and professionally, and they'll be capturing that evening. So we'll be able to you know, edit that into a piece that's appropriate and then share that with you and, and others as well. Oh, that is fantastic. Yeah. Uh yeah, well done. That's good. <laughs> good thinking. Well, look, I, I'm going to leave it there. I'm now going to um, grab some links and show the uh, the trailer. I wish you well. I hope it goes well. Um, and I hope you have a fantastic year. And we'll catch up again sometime soon. Yeah. Well, thank you. Please, it will stay in touch. You stay in touch. Stay well. And thank you. My pleasure. Bye All for right. now. Bye. Bye-bye. I thought I was doing everything right. I married young, and we had three kids by the time I was 30. Fast forward many years, and then I turned 50. I always figured by now I'd be rich, my kids would be grown, and my wife and I would be on our way to retirement. But that isn't what happened. I went bankrupt. We went through a divorce, and our oldest son was addicted to opiates. I was depressed, and I had felt like I'd failed. So I decided to get away with my best friend Scott, who just so happens to be my brother, and go on a scuba diving trip. Now on this trip I met this guy named Jim and he takes people who are wheelchair users scuba diving. It's called adaptive diving. When they get under the water they have this astronaut moment and they feel this sense of freedom and independence. And I thought, I need a life changing experience right now. So I called him and I said, hey, let's make a documentary about adaptive divers. Then life did what life does. It gave me a challenge to overcome. Seven days before the trip, my 27-year-old son died of a drug overdose. After some conversation, my family and I decided that I should still go and we'd have the funeral after I got back. So I went on this trip to be of service and to tell a story. And I invite you to join me and see what happens and watch as I try to heal my heart and go on my soul's journey. My name is David Marsh.